Welcome back to the Parent Connection. For our second segment, we will discuss from discipline, from punishment to discipline. Our guest speaker is Ms. Jody Johnson Powell. Ms. Jody Johnson Powell is a licensed social worker, certified life, family life educator, and one of only a few second generation parent educators in the world. She is the founder of the Family Network president of the Parents Tool Shop Consulting, and the author of more than 100 parenting resources, including her award-winning book, The Parents Tool Shop. For 30 years, Jody has trained parents and family professionals through her dynamic workshops and interviews with the media worldwide, including Parents Magazine, the Identikid television series, and the host of the Parents Tool Talk internet radio show. Jody is also the parent expert for Cox Ohio Publishing website, Chicks Mom Magazine, and many other parenting websites. You can learn more about Jody, her classes, and resources at parentstoolshop.com. Welcome, Jody. Thanks, Sherry. It's great right. to be here. Good. So, what would you like to tell to the parents? Well, tonight our topic is from discipline to punishment. And um, the subtitle of it is How to Discipline Without Being the Bad Guy and Get Self-Disciplined Kids. Mm -hmm. So as we uh, take just a quick look tonight at okay. punishment versus discipline, uh, the first place to start would be what is the difference? So the, to really boil it down, the really basic difference between punishment and discipline is that discipline focuses on teaching children from the mistakes that they make and punishment focuses more on imposing suffering for whatever it is that they did, uh, for the mistakes that they made. There's this hidden belief that people need to suffer in order to be able to learn. And so I, I'd like to ask you all to just imagine something for a while. So imagine as you all came in to this show um, that as you sat down, handcuffs went around your ankles and your arms on your chair. And for the remainder of my presentation, you're handcuffed to your chair. So let me, uh, and I'll give the audience permission to uh, answer questions here for just a second while I'm on this slide. But tell me, folks, how would you feel if while you were learning, you were chained to your chair? How would you feel about me? Okay. Would, you can speak up. Okay. However, if you just let me sit here, then I probably wouldn't like you at all. Okay. So you're probably not going to like me a whole lot, right? Now, throughout, as you're trying to learn about a subject, what are you going to be focusing more on? Are you going to be focusing more on what I'm saying, or every time you go to move, you can't move because there's handcuffs on you? Yeah, you're going to be distracted from the learning because of that little bit of suffering uh, that I'm adding on. You know, I'm not really harming you in any way, but it's just annoying and distracting enough that it's hard to pay attention to the lesson. So that's really kind of this hidden belief that we have to add somehow some kind of suffering in order for people to learn, when really it's much more a focus of helping children focus on the actual lesson that that mistake holds for them. There's a little diamond of a lesson in every mistake that folks can learn from. Um, a lot of people wonder at what point they've crossed the line, um, and sometimes it can seem kind of vague. At what point is someone disciplining? When are they punishing? And then at what point might punishment go to abuse? So if you want to take a look at the scale there that's um, on your handout and on the PowerPoint, um, discipline holds children accountable without adding any extra suffering. Children are held accountable for their mistakes, but we don't add any extra suffering. To the left of that, as you're looking at the, at the PowerPoint there, or at the screen, as soon as we impose suffering, then it turns into punishment. Now, again, it's still on a range. It can be from something very mild, like just feeling bad, to something more extreme of maybe of, of hurting, maybe even physical pain. The line at which punishment then goes over to abuse is when harm is, is that suffering causes harm. So it's, it's a lot clearer, it's not quite a gray line, um, but that's kind of how you can know at what point you're crossing the line. Um, in terms of, a lot of people will say, well, if I don't punish, then that means I'm gonna, I can't do anything. 
And that would be going to the complete opposite extreme, which would be permissive, which is either not disciplining often enough, consistently enough, or not disciplining at all. And that's kind of forgetting about that whole middle section that you're looking at there that's discipline, which is still holding children accountable, but doing it without necessarily harming or hurting them or adding extra suffering. So just a very brief, I could probably, um, I've, I've known whole hours of just about research on discipline versus punishment, but to really boil it down, um, when we really look at what the summary of all the research says, and the most recent study was uh, in April of 2010, which is very recent, and it was probably the most valid research study so far because it accounted for all other factors that resulted in the outcomes of the research aside from the corporal punishment. Um, and that's what most of the studies have been on, is corporal punishment. In general, what it, if we could kind of summarize what they all look like, punishment might work in the short run, but it's not been shown to get consistently positive results long term. It has been shown to frequently get negative outcomes. Not all the time, but frequently. Discipline is equally or more effective in the short run, and it has been shown to get only consistent positive results long term. There are no negative outcomes associated with effective discipline techniques. So kind of the bottom line in general, both of them can work, but only one consistently works short term and gets only positive long term results. So if you want to kind of boil that down in terms of a quick tip and an easy way to remember, um, is just because it works now as a quick fix doesn't mean we should do it. I often joke and say, um, you know, if Sherry won't shut up here, I can always put duct tape on her mouth. And that'll get her to be quiet, but that doesn't mean I should do it. Um, you know, likewise, I could, I could handcuff her to the chair, um, but that didn't, it might work to keep her still, but that doesn't mean that I should do it. So that's kind of just an, an easy way. What we really want to think about is what is our discipline teaching? and take a look at whether or not there's any hidden messages, maybe underlying um, lessons that might be there, and is that really the message that we want to send? Because sometimes things will work in the short run, but then in the long run, it, do, it isn't always effective or we can end up having a side effect later on that we didn't exactly anticipate. So if we say that we want for children to learn from discipline, we have to ask what is it that we want them to learn? What we want them to learn is that they are responsible for their behavior choices, that their behavior is a choice, and that whatever choice they make, they'll be held accountable. Positive or negative, they're going to experience the outcomes of the choices that they make. So discipline is really making sure that children understand they are responsible and we will be held accountable. For discipline to be effective, we can take a look at Jane Nelson who's the author of Positive Discipline, and she provides four R's that we can keep in mind to help us know how to discipline effectively. The first R is that we want for our discipline to be logically related to what the child did so that it makes sense. Um, if, uh, I'll, I'm gonna just pick on, keep picking on Sherry here. <laughs> if Sherry were to ride her bike in the street, I wouldn't uh, keep, take her away dinner from her that doesn't make as much sense as something that has to do with the bike going away because she rode her bike in the street. So it has to be logically related so it makes sense. And that way children will learn a lesson from it. The second is that it needs to be respectful. And there's two parts to that. One is that the discipline itself is respectful. And if you recall our uh, scale that we had um, in the previous PowerPoint, if we're imposing suffering, or certainly if we're harming, that wouldn't be respectful. So uh, discipline stays in that middle zone where the discipline itself is respectful. And the second part of it is that the way that we present it is respectful. So it's not humiliating, condescending, um, things that would bring on what Jane Nelson calls the four R's of punishment, um, which is um, revenge, retreat, rebellion, and withdrawal. Retreat or withdrawal. Uh, the third R of discipline is that you want it to be reasonable. And there's two parts to reasonable. The first part to reasonable has to do with how long it lasts. Your general rule of thumb is that you want it to be just long enough that the child learns the lesson that they need to learn, and, but it's not so long that it then starts distracting from the lesson. So there comes a point where children will understand initially when the discipline starts, and they'll say, okay, I understand why this is happening. They think about it. They say, okay, I got it. I understand why this happened. 
If it continues beyond that, then they start thinking about other things. You know, their, their attention can start to shift to, all right, why is this lasting so long? I already learned the lesson. You know, when is this going to end? And so things start to shift. There's no hard and fast rule for how long a discipline needs to last. Um, I'm sure a lot of you have heard, you know, things like one minute for every year of age and that type of thing. But it really depends on the situation and it depends on the child as to whether or not they've learned that lesson. And there are ways that you can tell um, that, that they will have learned the lesson and we'll be talking about that in just a second. The second aspect of reasonable has to do with the extent of the discipline. So um, a good example of that would be... Um, Again, Sherry, you're just misbehaving all over the place tonight, aren't you? Because I'm picking on you. Um, let's say Sherry, I asked her to wash the dishes, and she washed all the dishes, but then I find a dish that's dirty. So unreasonable would be now Sherry has to wash all the dishes over, even the clean ones. And the whole time Sherry's washing a clean dish, she's thinking, why in the heck am I washing a clean dish? Reasonable would be she goes back and she fixes her mistake. If she missed a dish, she cleans the dirty dish. Um, it's kind of um, if, if um, somebody mows the lawn and misses a strip. We don't have to mow the whole lawn again, just the strip. It's kind of like if you went to the, to, the, to the barber or the hairstylist and you had them cut your hair and they missed a little, you know, your one little piece of bangs was too long. You don't say, okay, cut all my hair again. You would just have them go back and fix the one mistake that they made. So that's reasonable. The last R is the only one that can ever not be there, and that's that whenever possible, you want the discipline to be revealed ahead of time. Stuff happens. You don't always know what kids are going to do, and sometimes they'll surprise you. Um, so sometimes you can't reveal it ahead of time. But whenever possible, you want children to know what their behavior choices are, and if they choose to misbehave, why, what will happen if that occurs. And what you would be revealing is the discipline that fits the four R's.